To be here, I see many, many friends. Now, they haven't taught me how to work this, so let's see if this works. Oh, okay. So, what I'm... Actually, I'd like you to do some homework for me. Um, the reason is, I've gone from the geek side to the political side. And as a politician, one of the things I need to do is to do a lot of sales pitch. The first kind of sales pitch is within our own bureau and department to make sure that we have everybody on side. Secondly is we need to sell our message within the Hong Kong government itself because we, knew, we know we need a lot of collaboration. And then thirdly, of course, we need to take our message to the people and convince them. Many of you earlier on have talked about the kind of uh, collaboration that is necessary to get this done. So what I want to share with you is what I'm doing inside and outside the government. So this is my kind of political story. But of course it's an incomplete story and I want to show it to you, I want to share it with you and get your feedback to see how we can do it better. My first message as a politician is we do need to know ourselves. Know thyself. Now, in terms of solving the problem in Hong Kong, we do need to understand the geography, meteorology, history, and economy of this area. Now, this doesn't come as a surprise to any of you, but it is important to see the context of where we are. This is the Pearl River Delta. What I have not done is given you a um, jurisdictional demarcation between Hong Kong and Shenzhen, Guangdong province. I'm just assuming you, you all know uh, what you're looking at. At the right-hand tip, that's Hong Kong, the three circles that you see are the three ports in our, in, in, in our region. There's actually a fourth port further up called Guangzhou, but Hong Kong, Shenzhen, Guangzhou, this is a very, very busy port logistics and shipping area. Just a little bit about this area. We are a small city by Chinese standards. We only have about 7 million people here. In our region, the Pearl River Delta, this is about 40% um, of Guangdong province in terms of land mass. But this is the heart of one of the world's most productive export production centers. So this is an industrial area. So what is the history of this area? This area started to develop in the very early 1980s. When you come to a city like Hong Kong, you think of us, you walk around and everybody tells you this is about financial services. We are Asia's leading financial center outside Tokyo. Um, this is a tourism center and all of these things are true. But what we forget is Hong Kong is actually also an industrial economy. Except our manufacturers are no longer within the Hong Kong city's jurisdiction. We've moved across the border. We started moving there in the 1980s. From about the 1980s, this is also when a major relocation of uh, production from the west to the east. And this is one of the first area in China, perhaps in Asia, where we started to take on heavy manufacturing for exports back to the west. So no wonder this is an area where we have a lot of pollution. We are at the southern tip in Hong Kong. The heart of that production is just behind us. There's 55 million people in this region, 7 million people in Hong Kong. Well, this actually tells us a very important part of the story. We have high ambient air pollution, and in each of the cities, in each of the areas where people live, including in my city of Hong Kong, we have many black spots. Those are mainly transportation related, and because in our region we're also a major port, shipping emissions is a major pollution. Now, these are the kinds of maps you see all the time. Um, basically, I just want to show this to see what science can help us to understand. Because as politicians, people always ask us, Where's the pollution really coming from? Why is it affecting us? Well, it's very important to be able to integrate a number of different scientific disciplines to be able to explain what is going on. Now, then of course, we've talked about exposure this morning. 
exposure is really important, but exposure is not necessarily always understood by politicians, by members of the public, and by the media. In Hong Kong, in the heart of our city, I'm afraid we have many pollution black spots, and that's partly to do with the morphology of our city. We have many narrow roads, very tall buildings on both sides, very high population moving up and down all the time, and many, many, many cars. Now, we have another problem. This is probably a problem we have throughout Asia. We have lots and lots of old vehicles that are still highly polluting. Well, in Hong Kong, and you can compare this with um, your city, now, Hong Kong is a very, very wealthy city, and I think this is a lesson for all of us. We mustn't forget, as we get rich, not to tighten our policies on various sources of pollution. So in Hong Kong, you can see on the left side, those are our franchise buses. Now these are the, the you could say, regulated buses, providing fixed, uh, fixed routes. And then you can see the trucks. Because we are a logistics center, because we have major ports here, we have a lot of trucks running up and down to the whole of the Pearl River Delta, and we have many delivery vans going around the city all the time. So you can see that amongst our vehicular fleet, the diesel commercial vehicles, the single group of vehicles that is the most polluting in Hong Kong, how many pre-Euro vehicles we still have? For those of you who come from Western cities, you might find quite surprised to still see so many. So one of the lessons that we must all learn is as our city evolves, as we develop, as we get richer, don't forget to fix the problems as you go along. Fixing those problems, it's about good politics. It's about working with the industry and communities. It's about bringing local politicians on board to understand that there's an exposure problem, there's a health problem, a cost problem. Well, then we have another problem, which is not controlled by the Environmental Dep uh, Protection Department. This is our um, transport department. Uh, responsibilities. We have worsening traffic on our streets, we have therefore more pollution on our roads. Our average speed on our roads has been slowing down and I'm sure you're seeing this in many of your cities as well. Well on our projection on the right hand side, this is 2017, our government estimates that we're going to have many more private vehicles on our roads. Just having them as electric vehicles or hybrid vehicles isn't going to be enough. We want to make sure that we don't have congestions throughout the city. Now, I already talked about the port. Uh, if you have a chance, if you're from outside Hong Kong, if you have a chance to walk around our city, um, look at how close our port is to where people live and people work. And then think about the pollution. I always like to show behind the port where those folks are, are living. We now know, because we have done the research, that Hong Kong in particular is very badly affected by shipping pollution. Because of the shipping lanes, because of the shipping paths, you can see that uh, on the far left-hand side, the red spot is uh, the port of Shenzhen, the one in the middle is the port of Hong Kong, and on the right-hand side is the other Shenzhen port called Yantian. And these ships, as they move around, basically Hong Kong is sort of enveloped by, by major ocean-going vessels. So it tells us that this is an area where we do need to pay particular attention. I wanted to show this map. I plagiarized this map from uh, my, my friend. Uh, Simon Ng, who is sitting in the audience, I'll do a bit of pitch for him. Tomorrow I think he's uh, doing a, um, a talk about ports and shipping emissions. I wanted to show this map uh, to people to also emphasize the kind of good cutting-edge science that we can be doing. You have the ability here to show how to use science to do this sort of explanation that I can use as a politician to go and talk to others and to convince the public what is the particular situation in my city. Okay, so now this should not come as a surprise to you. So the conclusion from our administration is that we must improve roadside air quality. And my minister gave you a number of initiatives that, uh, uh, that we're gonna push. 
in a matter of the next few months. We also need ships to switch fuels as they berth in Hong Kong. If you come from North America, if you come from Europe, you already know as these big ships come into your jurisdictional waters, they have to do a multiple range of activities to improve their emissions. Uh, in Asia, I believe we have no port yet that is doing anything like ports are doing in North America and in Europe. This is obviously where we need to go next. In Hong Kong, we've made a small start. We have a voluntary scheme to get the ocean-going vessels to switch fuels as they berth. We want to regulate. We want it to become mandatory. And we want to take the scheme across the border to our neighbors in Guangdong. We would like that within the next few years, we may be able to collaborate uh, and work very closely with the uh, Guangdong province so that the whole of the waters of the PRD could be turned into a low emission zone. Now, these are things that you've seen. Um, basically, I wanted to show these pictures just to emphasize that in Hong Kong, it's no longer possible just to work on end-of-pipe solutions. We need to integrate policies to make sure that we're using technology, we're using parking management, coordinated signals. Uh, we need to uh, also promote walking and all the things that we've been talking about and that you will talk about in the next two days into our policy making. But you know, you know how hard it is to get people in different departments to work together. So this is one of the major, major challenges for I think every city, not just for us in Hong Kong. Um, road charging. I don't know whether you know that in 1982, Hong Kong was the first government to do a study, a study in 1982 that went nowhere. We still haven't got it today. Electronic road pricing pops up from time to time uh, in our political discussion. But we're not able to take it forward because we haven't got political consensus in terms of doing it. We now see London have done it, we see Singapore have done it, and they've shared their stories with us. But in terms of implementing these kinds of um, tools to manage uh, transport better, these are the integrated decision-making we all need to go on. So I just want to share my pain with you. It is not easy to do it, even if we were the first city to have actually commissioned a study in 1982. Now, this is Seoul. I'm sure you all know about it. Uh, a few years ago, uh, when I was uh, with the think tank Civic Exchange, we had the privilege of inviting a, uh, an official from the city of Seoul to come and share with us um, their transportation vision. And of course, we all know about the uh, Chiang Kai -jai, um, uh, vision where they took down a six-lane highway and recreated uh, the river that they had running through the city. Now, this is a story I always like to go and tell, to say, how did they do it? This official, he told us that to get it done, they had 4,000 meetings of different sorts in two years. Just imagine, in your city, if you wanted to do something major, what it takes to have 4,000 meetings in two years to get it done. Now, but I'm not giving up. I'm now going to show you something in Hong Kong. This is a picture of um, a part of our uh, city on the Hong Kong island side. This particular road is called Daver Road, is in the heart of the financial area. Of course, it doesn't look anything like this. Right now, there's buses and all kinds of vehicles going up and down the road all the time. There's a government monitoring station not far from there, and the air quality is poor. In 2001, a group of uh, planning, architectural, uh, and urban, urban professionals, they created this and showed it around Hong Kong. And what they said was, this is possible. This is not a pipe dream. Well, of course, it hasn't happened yet. I'm still hoping we can start to think about how to do this. This would be a kind of Hong Kong equivalent to the Seoul example. People are getting excited again, because what we've done in the meantime is that we've built a, 
a new road that is supposed to further relieve traffic, we've also extended our rail system. So obviously on Hong Kong Island, this is one major part of Hong Kong, it is time to think about how we rearrange, reorganize transportation. This kind of ideas is probably right for this time in Hong Kong. So the professionals are all coming up again and putting their hand up and say, can we get back to discussing this? Um, I was also told last night by Hong Wing Dat of uh, Poly U University, whom I'm sure many of you know, that also at Poly University they have this idea because they have a traffic black spot right next to the university. This is where the cars go in and out of the busiest tunnel to get onto the Hong Kong Island side. I'm not going to steal his thunder. He has a wonderful idea about how the university, different disciplines, can come together to create something phenomenal in that area to also reduce air pollution. So those are the kinds of big ideas we need in our cities. Now, the last point I want to say is we see a lot of days like this. The majority of our days, in fact, are close to looking like this. When we have these days, very, very smoggy days, it's because we have very, very smoggy conditions in the whole of our area. So this is a regional smog problem. Well, you've seen the two buttons uh, in brown and blue, but so the last part of our policy direction is the green button. We must collaborate closely with our neighbor, with Guangdong province. We need to collaborate with them, both on science, which we have done. Hong Kong has a very good set of monitoring stations here. My colleagues at EPD, they're the masters in working on this. Um, also, there is now a network of monitoring stations in the whole of the Pearl River Delta in Guangdong province. This is the leading air monitoring system in the whole of China. This is the one where our national government holds up to say if other areas in China are going to do it, they can learn from Guangdong and Hong Kong. We're very, very proud of that. So we must continue to do this. We must continue to do joint science with our partners on the mainland so that they can provide evidence-based information for policy making. The last slide I'm going to show is uh, a ceremony I went to about 10 days ago. This is, a, um, this is a wonderful project where five years ago the Hong Kong government decided to put out about 12 million US dollars, which is very, very little, uh, to see how we can use that money to stimulate Hong Kong owned factories across the border in the PRD, to stimulate them to invest in cleaner production. So every dollar that the Hong Kong government spends, the factories actually have, actually have to spend a lot more. It has worked very well. We've found a system where we can track what are the reductions, and they are phenomenal. There's a lot of low-hanging fruit in the production uh, factories across the border. We in the Hong Kong government, we've obviously started to work with those where there's a Hong Kong connection. The Guangdong government have also created now their own program, the cleaner production program for Gu other Guangdong owned factories. So together we now have a joint program and this was the sort of acknowledgement. We went to give placards to, uh, to the good guys who did major emissions reduction. This is an area of future collaboration. This is an area where I feel that if we get the, the right mix of policies and, and money and resources, that we could be part of China's 13 five-year plan to start major or more major emissions reduction in the production uh, export enterprises in our region. So that is the story for us. That's what my government in the next few years would like to take on board. I've shared this with you. I'd like to hear your comments. I'd like to hear any ideas that you may have that we could collaborate on. Thank you very much. Truly, there is a lot we can learn from Hong Kong 
and a lot we can share with Hong Kong. And the decision to bring the AQ back to Hong Kong after 10 years was the right decision. Since BAQ is a way for learning among cities and between cities, let me now call on a member of the Board of Trustees of Clean Air Asia to introduce our keynote speaker. Please help me welcome Associate Professor at the Delhi School of Economics and adjunct faculty at Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy at the National University of Singapore, Dr. Srikant Gupta. Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of uh, Clean Air Asia and our BAQ partners, uh, it gives me great pleasure to welcome Mr. Christian Gebler, Permanent Secretary for Urban Development and Environment for the State of Berlin, to deliver the keynote address of Better Air Quality 2012. As you know, Berlin is not only the capital of Germany and its largest city, with three and a half million inhabitants, but it is also one of the country's 16 federal states. It's a city-state. It's also the second largest city in Europe as uh, defined by city limits after London. And Berlin, as we all know, has a very rich history, uh, rich heritage, and is enjoying a renaissance ever since reunification 22 years ago. And one that has transformed the city, and it is now once again one of the great cities of the world. Secretary Gebler has played a key role in all of this. Uh, in particular, in making it a green city, where one-third of the city's area now comprises forests, parks, gardens, rivers, and lakes. He has also taken Berlin beyond just the concept of mobility to a holistic concept of urban access. And for the last 20 years, under the guidance of Secretary Gabler and his uh, colleagues, Berlin has pursued a policy of access from pedestrian crossings to the creation of a modern transport infrastructure to public buildings and open spaces. And this has been so successful that just two days ago, on December 3rd, uh, as we started gathering here for BAQ, Berlin was declared winner of the prestigious Access City Award for 2013, instituted by the European Commission. And this recognizes and celebrates cities with over 50,000 citizens and uh, inhabitants in Europe, uh, which take exemplary initiatives to improve accessibility in the urban environment. So congratulations, Secretary. So as I mentioned, Secretary Gabler has played a key role in the transformation of Berlin into a livable city. Born in December 1964, he will be celebrating his 40th birthday in three days' time. Uh, Secretary Gabler studied transportation engineering at Berlin's Technical University. And at a young age of 17, while still a student, he joined the Social Democratic Party, which is one of the two biggest parties in Germany. And he has been a committed member since then of the, uh, of the party, the party called SPD. And with its very strong welfare orientation, it is no surprise that Secretary Gabler has translated that into making Berlin a sustainable and accessible and inclusive city. For 16 years, since 1995 to 2011, uh, Secretary Gabler was a member of the Berlin Parliament and a leading light of his party. In addition to being an ex 